Hi folks and welcome to the Boombot V2 episode one. Uh, this is a project that we're doing at BCIT and technology, uh, technology Teacher Education 5060 Teaching Electronics 2 course. And for the last couple of weeks, people have been busy uh, designing uh, these little robots right here. And well, building them mostly. And they've got a uh, top that flips up and a printed circuit board that pops up and you can get in and get at the batteries and uh, we're going to take a look at now that it's together what do i do with it so we're going to be uh, running some arduino code on here and look at that i i'm so excited i even got yeah, a fancy title screen right there so uh there's your boom bot and uh, you might not have all the doodads on it just yet so let's just open it up and take a look on here and see what we're eventually going to be adding now some of these things uh for my students anyways are a ways off in the future uh the esp32 cam uh, I've installed it on mine. Uh, you're not going to have that right now. Um, you might have your DF Player Mini from uh, from uh, last semester, and that's kind of neat because uh, when you get that all hooked up and running, you'll be able to turn it on and... Whoa, R2-D2 is stuck inside my robot. But uh, we're going to take that out for right now because uh, you don't have that in your robot yet, and we'll talk about how to install that. A uh, couple little tricks when you're getting a DF Player Mini to talk to an Arduino. Uh, if you just follow the guides, it probably won't work right. There's a lot of tricks in how you have to format the micro SD card to make it work. A little later on, we're going to add an ESP8266 unit right here. And that's going to let you drive this about from your phone or wirelessly from the joystick board that you've also built. So you don't have uh, that on there. Uh, at some point, you'll uh, get an ultrasonic rangefinder. In fact, I think I included the ultrasonic rangefinders in your kit. So we'll be using that to do some object seeking and avoiding. And uh, hopefully you've got your own Arduino. And uh, let me just pop that off right there so you can see underneath. Now, down below inside here, when you pop the lid open, there's a few things. I've got a speaker stuffed into mine. Uh, that goes very nicely with the uh, DF Player Mini, but you won't have that just yet either. So I'll pull that right out of there. And uh, you can see right here, I've got my um, cable coming up from the edge detectors right here at the front. And they loop around right in here and come up and plug in right here. I've got my two motors uh, plugged in. Let me flip this up so you can see it maybe a little bit better. The edge detector comes in here in green because it's a 28 gauge connector. Uh, right in here we've got red, which is the 22 gauge connector. I think I've actually crammed some 20 gauge wire into that. And down here I've got my batteries. Now it's really important, of course, to pay attention down at the bottom. You'll notice uh, that one of the batteries says motor battery on this side right here. Okay, so the motor battery is going to come uh, over here and that is going to plug into your big heavy motor battery, the four double A's right here. And on the other side, we've got our logic battery, which is the nine volt that comes in. And actually, where does that run? There's our nine volt. Comes right along in here and plugs in on this side here. Okay, so just take a look at that. They are marked on the bottom, they say, motor battery and plus nine volt and pay attention because you don't want to be hooking things up there's plus nine volt and ground on there and uh, why hook them up backwards why hook uh, the plus nine volt up where the other side should be going okie doke so uh, let's take a look at um, what we can do to test this board. I assume that you've got some charged batteries here. And even if you don't have the motor, motor batteries just yet, we can test a lot of things just by plugging this into our Arduino. So uh, let's uh, close that lid back down. And if you've got batteries on there, you should see that you've got some switches right in this corner here. Let's see if I can get the camera to focus a little bit on this right here where it's motors are uh, the motor switch is right in here. So if your motor battery is hooked up and you turn that on, you should see that LED turn on to indicate that you have voltage to your motor battery. And if you turn this switch on, you shouldn't see this hookup because our nine volt side actually relies on the five volt regulator in the Arduino 
to give us uh, the logic side of the circuit. On your Arduino, there's actually a power supply circuitry uh, set up right in here with a self-resetting fuse and a voltage regulator, a couple of capacitors, and somewhere there's a diode in there to protect it as well. So your Arduino, uh, we're leveraging its ability to do the, um, to do the power supply. On your board underneath the Arduino, I just want to take a look. This is our L293D quadruple half H motor driver chip. And you will have uh, soldered it in place using surface mount soldering so that on this side, you either see a notch right here or a little uh, dot right here to indicate that pin one comes on this side. This is what we're going to use to control the power coming to your motors. But if you don't have your motor battery hooked up, don't panic because we've also hooked up a couple of LEDs to indicate what outputs are coming to this chip. Okay, so uh, in order to get our logic power, we are going to need to have the Arduino hooked up on here. So let's go ahead and put that on. Be gentle, don't break it on your first day with it. And make sure that's pushed down nice and snug onto the board. Now, um, to power up the Arduino, you can turn on that switch. And now you'll see that red LED powers up. And uh, then we'll turn that off. Or you can just plug into your um, computer and you get a boop, boop, boop sound as this connects uh, into your system. And that light comes on right there. So uh, before we get too much into how the um, uh, all the doodads on here work, I want to take a look at, um, at, at the circuit design itself and go over uh, some of the parts of the power supply. So I'm just going to minimize this window right down here, shrink it down a little bit. We'll come back to looking at the uh, robot a little later on. And here we've got some code and I've got Design Spark open. Now Design Spark is my um, uh, electronic CAD EDA um, program of choice. And I'm just gonna turn off the grid here. It doesn't need to be on. And so here is the schematic as published. It's in the uh, first page of the uh, electronics assembly guide second, third page, somewhere in there. Anyways, it's in the electronics assembly guide. And I wanted to walk you through some of the key parts of it. I also have the uh, printed circuit board design right in here. And it looks a little different from ones that you've seen. And I'll talk a bit about how that comes together as well. So let's take a look at the power supply part of the circuit first. And the power supply part of the circuit is up in the top right here, just above your Arduino. And if you look in there, you can see that we've got two batteries, BAT1 and BAT2. And the reason we've got two batteries is that one battery is going to provide power to our motors, and the other battery is going to provide power to the logic side of the circuit. There's different ways to go about doing this, but this is maybe one of the less efficient ways, but definitely one of the simpler ways. Okay, And the challenge that we run into is that our battery pack inside the Arduino here for the motors is four double A's, which works really nicely. It gives us about the right voltage for the motors that we're using, you know, somewhere around uh, somewhere around six volts when everything's fully charged and working really well. But as you'll know from our mini sumo project and some of the calculations that we did in there, when motors start up, they draw a lot of current and batteries have internal resistance. So when these batteries in here, when our motor batteries start to have a lot of current drawn from them, there becomes a voltage drop across the batteries. And we're running them through some pretty tiny wires. So there's a voltage drop through those wires as well. And that means that by the time our six volt battery right out here comes in through the wires, up to the board, through the switch, okay, and starts heading in towards the Arduino, if we were to power that just off of the motor battery, that voltage can sometimes drop below five volts. And if it gets too far below five volts, your Arduino shuts down because your Arduino requires five volts in order to keep running. So even though 
this is a six volt battery. It's not always a six volt battery. When the batteries get old and tired, when uh, they're under heavy load, that voltage is gonna sag a little bit. And if you think about your car, you've got a 12 volt battery in your car, it powers your headlights, you go to start your car and the lights dim a little bit. It's not a problem in your car because there are other systems in place to make sure that your uh, electronics in your car stay powered up. Um, but on your robot, the other system that we have in place is we have a nine volt battery right here, BAT2, and BAT2 comes up through a logic switch right here and then comes around here. Oh, don't zoom in right there. Sorry about that, folks. There we go. And BAT2, when it's turned on, comes down here and comes through this line right down to the V in pin on your Arduino. Now the V in pin is the same pin that you get if you plug a power supply into this uh, socket on the back of the Arduino. That comes in and that's the pin that goes in through the voltage regulator. So even though we're putting nine volts, a nine volt battery to a five volt board, the regulator on board the Arduino and the capacitors on board the Arduino and the diodes on the Arduino and the self-resetting fuse on there are going to act as our power supply to hopefully give us a fairly stable five volt power supply, no matter what the motors are doing or what the state of charge of our battery motors is. Now, when we plug in to our USB, the computer gives us that five volt supply. Okay, so we can actually do this. And you'll notice that while I'm doing this, to save batteries, I've got my batteries all turned off. I'm just plugged into the Arduino, or sorry, into the computer right now, and I'm getting five volts over my USB. Keep in mind that most computers limit you to about 500 milliamps uh, over USB, so that's not enough power to run your motors. Okay, that's why we're only gonna use this for testing some of the logic functions today. So that's what's going on in here. Now, because we might want to get just a little fancier, I did add a diode between the two systems. So if at some point you want to play around and you want to try putting six double A's into here, essentially giving you a big nine volt battery and running your motors at a higher voltage, probably not that good for the motors, but all the electronics on the board should be able to handle it. Okay, if you want to run your motors at a higher voltage, you can do that. And by pulling out the nine volt battery, what happens is that when uh, this motor switch is turned on, if the voltage here is higher than the voltage right here, it will flow through this diode, okay, and come down and it will power up your motor, uh, power up your logic when the switch is turned off. So you can technically, now let me just unplug from the Arduino right here. And if I turn the motors on right now, you'll see that I've got both lights coming on right here. That's because I've got six volts at the, uh, at the motor battery. It's coming in here. It's powering up this battery, uh, this Arduino right here. And that's giving me my five volts here. That's coming through this diode connection right here. But if the voltage at the batteries voltage in this line up here were to ever drop below five volts, then we'd lose that. Our capacitor would sustain us for maybe a millisecond or two of power draw, and then our Arduino would shut down and it would stop powering the motors and the motors would stop and you'd have this robot that goes chink, 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 along there. Um, not very productive. So uh, that's mostly what's going on up here in the power supply system. Our standard application is going to be four double A's right here with an on off switch right here. When the switch is in the on position, the power is going to uh, come in here. There's our motor power LED that you see turned on and uh, it's uh, going to come down and turn that on. And where does it go after that? Well, our motor power comes right down here and it goes to a couple of uh, different places. Uh, the two things that need uh, motor power it comes right down here and it comes to our L293D for driving our motors, obviously. And somewhere in here, right over here, it comes right out here 
to motor three where we've got a transistor. Now motor three is only going to be an on off type of switch. There's only one transistor there. It's not an H drive, uh, but uh, it is good enough for powering a little cannon up on top of your robot or something like that. So our main battery power flows out of the battery right in here. Pardon all the bouncing around on there. Comes up through this wire. If the switch is thrown into the on position, it comes through here. It can power up your logic side if you've got enough um, power uh, in your batteries and they're not dropping low because uh, you're drawing a lot of current to run the motors. It comes out here, it turns on an LED and you see uh, that LED turn on anytime you get power. And then it comes down right through here. Uh, oh, it also comes over here. So if you hook up a servo, uh, there's a header right here, and the standard setup for servos is to have, one of the standard setups, is to have the power coming out the middle pin. So you could actually take a small uh, SG90 servo or something like that, mount it on your robot and have it do something cool, and you would draw your power from the motor side of the circuit, not the logic side of the circuit. Uh, also in here, the uh, motor power comes out to this header right here, which is controlled by the TIP120 transistor and sinks into ground so you can turn a, an external motor on and it comes down to your L293D which comes in here and goes out and it powers uh, your two main drive motors for the robot. Whew, there's the hookups for the two main drive motors for the robot right in your schematic there. So uh, let's just take a look at where that all sits on the printed circuit board. Okay. And uh, right in here, this is our main battery input. Okay, and we've got a ground side and we've got the signal side. Now this looks a little different from some of the circuit boards that you may have designed in the past because I've used copper pores extensively. And what I've done on here is I've, let's see, I think that's net 29, no, that's not, sorry, it's net 147. If I click on 147, you can see originally when I routed it, there's that little dark line that flashed in there. And that was how I originally routed power to get from the battery over to the switch. Okay, but um, because I wanted a little more meat, a little more copper to drive more power with a lower voltage drop, I used something called a copper pour to fill in all of this space right here. And so uh, you solder this joint right here, electricity comes right through here and right through here. It can use all of this copper to come over here, connect to this side. Your switch, when it's thrown in that position, it doesn't matter that those two are hooked together, but when you throw your switch in this direction, it comes right into here. Okay, now coming off that side, uh, you come into a track called motor power. And that motor power track on the, uh, on the board comes all the way here and you can also see that there's a big pour on here. It goes into your LED, drives right there, uh, comes all the way uh, down through here and it connects to your L293D right over on the side. So this is up on the top side of the board. There you can see it going into the uh, pins for the uh, TIP120 to control motor number three. And then we've also got a quick connection to our uh, um, servo header, which should be pointing out on the underside of the board. Now, one other thing I haven't mentioned that it does is you can see right here, it comes to a resistor and that resistor connects to another resistor. That resistor right there is connected to ground. And then a trace kind of burrows along underneath here and it goes back to your Arduino. This is going to be a little easier to see over here. So our power comes in off the motor battery, comes right up here, okay, and then comes into this line, and then it comes right down here. And what you see right here with these two 1K resistors is a voltage divider. Because they're both 1K resistors, they split the voltage in half. So that voltage comes down here and gets read, read on pin A3. So if you want to know the state of your uh, motor batteries, you can read that directly off of pin A3. You'll be reading a number that is half of the actual voltage because we have a voltage divider right here. We split the voltage in half, 
because the Arduino can only measure to a maximum of 5 volts. So this lets you use a battery up to 10 volts on here and still get real-time readings of what your uh, main drive battery voltage is. So useful if you want to know, uh, do I have fresh batteries in the, um, uh, in the robot? Okay, so there is some of the input systems. And uh, when you hook them up, I'm just going to turn that off to make sure I save battery. Make sure your switches are working. Some of these switches are a little bit fussy. Okay, and if you bump them, they'll flick on a little bit. Make sure that you've uh, got switches that turn off right there. I'm going to turn it back on using Arduino power right now. And uh, let's take a look at how we can put some code into here and how we can test some of our systems. Okay, I'm just going to start with a new code right here. Okay, so now to make this work, I like to uh, name some of the pins. And uh, the first pins that we're going to test are our LEDs right out here. Okay, may as well go for something fairly simple. And uh, so up at the beginning of the program, I like to get all my names, my declarations and definitions in right at the beginning. And I'm going to say const int. Okay, you can also use hashtag define if you uh, prefer that format. Okay, and I'm going to name LED underscore right for the right hand LED is going to be on pin 13. And in the left hand LED is going to be on pin 9. Now let's just take a look and see where those LEDs are on our schematic and how I knew they were on 13 and 9. So here are the LEDs tucked right in there. Okay, our left-hand LED and our right-hand LED. They're hooked up through a resistor and that resistor comes back to the board and there you can see that's coming in on pin 13. Okay, now uh, pin 9 actually does more than uh, just, well, both pins actually do more than just flash the LEDs. Right now, they're only going to flash the LEDs because you don't have anything hooked up. But I had a limited number of pins available on the Arduino when I was designing this board. So if I wanted to do many things with the Arduino, I needed to make each pin do more than one thing. So uh, let's take a look here. Pin 9, for instance, okay, not only controls this LED right here, but it can also send a data signal out to your servo. So if you've got a servo hooked up, you're going to end up flashing um, your uh, left-hand LED whenever you tr go to control the servo. Same thing, you can actually plug a speaker right across here. You just pin it between this pin and ground, and you can make 8-bit Arduino noises. So if you want to put a siren on there, or just you know, beep, 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 something like that, use the Arduino tone command. You can pop that in there. You don't have to use the fancy pants DF player to get sound out of your robot. We'll talk more about that in the you know, later episode. Uh, pin 13 right here also uh, has some spare sound functions because by the time it comes out right here and through the resistor, and uh, then you can see it travels right down here and right down here, and this goes to the RX pin of your DF Player Mini. So the DF Player Mini, uh, in order for it to work with your Arduino, talks with a serial data connection. So what that means is that as pin 13 turns on and off on your Arduino, it can send a signal right down here to the DF Player Mini, and that signal will be read by the DF Player Mini, and you can say play track one on the SD card, or play track two on the SD card, or crank the volume to the max. And so there's all these commands that you can send from your Arduino, and then have the DF Player Mini uh, take care of for you. But again, future episode down there, just pointing out why you see other things hooked up on here. Um, when we talk about that, we'll also talk about the fact that the DF Player Mini is a 3.3 volt device, and so that if we run our full 5 volts down in the RX pin on there, uh, it's not going to be very happy. So I've put this just upstream of a white LED, and as you know, a white LED has about a 2.7 to 3 volt forward voltage drop when it's turned fully on, so this should be about a 3 volt drop right here when we've got 5 volts coming out right here. We burn a couple volts off across the resistor, and we don't blow up our DF Player Mini. 
So you'll see I use diodes for, uh, for voltage dividers and voltage breaks in a few other places in the circuit as well. Alrighty, so uh, let's bring up some Arduino code and see if we can get uh, the LEDs to turn on and off uh, to test something on our robot. So here we go, we've come in, we've defined them, uh, constant LED right 13, LED left is nine. So our setup code right in here, if we want those to run as outputs, um, we need to uh, pin mode, spell it right. You'll notice it changes color when you spell it right. And bracket LED underscore right, comma, output, and pin mode, LED left, output. Okay, and if we want to just test them, we only need to test them once right at the beginning of the program. So we can say digital right, LED right, comma, high, delay 500, Digital right L oh, L E D right comma low then we'll turn L E D left on okay and then we'll turn it off. And just put a few comments in uh, for later on so that you can remember what you're doing. Slash, slash, uh, activate and test the LEDs. I also like to have something like this at the beginning of a startup sequence in my program so that I know if the Arduino has rebooted for some reason because the first thing it'll do will be flash a couple of lights at me. Okay, so the headlights up here, uh, yeah, they're kind of cool to have them on there as headlights and they look good, but mainly they're indicator lights that we can use to signal things like in this case, hey, the Arduino has just rebooted. Let's uh, see what port I'm on right here. And uh, let's send that code up and see what happens. Uh, compiling, uploading. And there we go, nothing too fancy. Um, it turned on and off. Now you do have a reset button on your Arduino. It's right underneath this corner, right down here. And so if you reach in underneath and press that reset button, your Arduino will reset. And there it goes again. And those two LEDs just turn on and off. And you know that your Arduino has rebooted because that's a little boot sequence. You can make whatever boot sequence you want right in there, but that tests your LEDs. And if they're not working right now, then you know that you should probably figure out why and solve that problem before you move on. Um, if it's just something simple, like you forgot to put a resistor in or you put the LED in backwards and you don't have the tools to fix that right now, uh, keep a little list of things that you need to fix. And next time you're in the shop, you can desolder that and put in a new LED in the correct orientation. Okay. Um, Let's see, what are we going to test next? Uh, let's uh, take a look at our button pins over here. Okay, you've got four buttons on the Arduino and they're going to be really handy for a number of things. Uh, also, those four buttons that you have right there are also the same four buttons that you have up on your joystick remote control. So if you've built the remote control board and put the buttons on there, they all talk on the same pin. They talk on pin A2. Now let's take a look at the schematic so that you can see what they're doing in there. And those switches that you're looking at are all tucked away right down in here. Now the ones off on the joystick board are set up using uh, the very same settings. In fact, you can see, um, let me, Why is it not zooming in for me? Okay, zoomed in a little too far. There we go. My mouse is fighting with me and it's winning right now. Sorry about that. 
Okay, so our switches are hooked up right in here, and they're basically one massive voltage divider. So uh, the way this all works is this is a line that goes back to your Arduino, and it's going to get re uh, read on pin two. Okay, we'll take a look at that part of the circuit in just a moment. But basically what we've got here is we've got five volts coming in right here. Now, this is a four resistor voltage divider. We're familiar with how a two resistor voltage divider works. Uh, two equal values uh, for resistors splits the voltage into two equal parts, splits it in half. Well, four equal values for the resistors gives us four different values um, for the voltage. So if I close this pin right here and I push down on SW, SW6, which is this one right in here, Okay, if I push down on that pin, then I get a full five volts coming this way and up to pin A2, and I'm gonna read something like 1023. Now, if I don't push that pin and it comes down right through here, uh, then I've dropped off by one quarter of the total voltage or about one quarter of my zero to 1023 range. So I'm gonna be reading somewhere in the 750 range if I put the next button down, okay? And then if I don't push those two buttons, then the voltage needs to come all the way down here. It's going to be now halfway between five volts and zero volts. So I'm gonna have about uh, uh, two and a half volts coming out here, or somewhere around 512 is gonna come back here and be read on A2. And finally down here, I'm gonna be around 240, 250 somewhere uh, when it comes back and reads all this. Now, I have put a 100K ohm resistor, super high resistor in here, but not so high that it doesn't pull this pin down to zero when none of the buttons are being pushed. So if none of these buttons are being pushed, this makes sure that we stay at zero volts, but uh, this is pretty high relatively. So when this is being pushed, we see really close to five volts, really close to two and a half volts, really close to somewhere between uh, two and a half and five, and really close to somewhere between two and a half and zero, probably one and a quarter-ish. Now, uh, what we're gonna do to test to make sure that those are working is we're going to use a serial print command and we are going to read the value that comes through on pin A2. Now, if you've got your joystick board finished and you hook the joystick board up, you'll be able to put it in here and you'll see that A2 also has a line that goes up to the joystick board where you'll see the exact same set of buttons. So you can push these buttons from your joystick board or right from here on the edge of your computer, uh, robot, something like that. So uh, let's take a look right here, uh, bring up our Arduino code. Okay, and let's add a uh, new name in here, and we will say this is the button pin. And that is going to be on pin A2. Okay, now we don't have to do anything in setup right here for the button pin in specific, but if I want to get data off the Arduino using a serial print command, I better go serial.begin. And we'll just use standard old 9600. And down in my void loop, I will say serial.println analog read. Oh, it's small a, isn't it? Brackets a2. Delay. 200. We don't need to kick that out too much. I'll get rid of this code before we start running the robot, but this will be a good way to test and see if the buttons work. Okay, so let's go ahead and upload that code. See a couple little flashes there as it uploads. There's our startup sequence. And now I can go and turn on my serial monitor. Now turning on your serial monitor will reboot the Arduino. And here we go, I'm getting readings of zero on A2. So now you should come along and you should test this. And as we said, when you push that first button, we get five volts coming through to pin A2. So that gives us a reading of 1023. If I push the next button, uh, yeah, we said that's gonna drop down um, 
do three quarters of the value. So this is about three quarters of 1023. And if I let go, and if I push the next button down, pretty close to 512, halfway to uh, 1024. And I let go, so you can. And if I bring it all the way down, I get 252. Now for some of the lower valued ones, you can push two of them together and you actually do get a combination, but for other ones, uh, that doesn't work out so well. Yeah, you can, there's a couple of combinations that you can get hooking them in there, but we've basically set it up. So we're expecting people to push one button at a time. And by reading the value on there, uh, you can tell which button was pushed. Lowest, second lowest, second highest, highest. So four different values that we can read. Let's see if we can make those buttons uh, do something useful for us. So right in here, I'm going to uh, do a read and I'm going to say uh, if analog read, oh, I guess I should have called it button pin. There we go. I was getting lazy in here on A2. So if analog read button pin, uh, let's say is greater than our second value is 750. Let's see if it's greater than 900. Okay, so that means that one of our buttons is pressed on there because it's at zero when no buttons are being pressed. Uh, then what we'll say is digital right LED LED left comma high. And if it's not, okay, else. Okay, and now let's just make sure I'm always can never remember whether it's helping me out with the ellipses or not. So if I just do an auto format right in here, I can see that this one indented after this one, this one indented underneath that one. So that's under control. I should be able to upload that and test one of my buttons. There's my start sequence. Oh, I used the less than command. I'm like, why is that thing staying on all the time? My button is working right here. I can control it by turning it, pushing on and off with my finger, but I wanted it to go uh, high when this was greater than 900. Now my next button down was reading 750-ish, 764, I think it said. Um, so I'm just gonna try this command in right here. And let's see if we can get the next button to work. Uh, if is greater than 700. Okay, so that's one set of circumstances. Now, if I say it's greater than 700, both buttons will turn on and activate this sequence. So I better check and say, and, Okay, logical and right here, both conditions have to be true. Is less than 800. And I better put some more brackets in here just so that it gets the entire logic statement right in here. So I want my if statement to be built upon everything right in between here. And then I've got two substatements and each of the substatements has brackets around them. So I do two tests right in here. This is one test. I say, run an analog read, send the pin up to the analog read, bring a value back, ask is it greater than 700? If it is, um, then this becomes true. 
then go and read this button bin and find out what its value is. If it's less than 800, this becomes true. And only if both of those conditions are true, will it do what comes next. And uh, just to save myself a little bit of time right here, I am going to copy that bit from right up there, pop that in. Don't think that did what I wanted it to. I think I cut it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's how I save time. Copy works so much nicer. And I'm just going to make it LED right in here. And upload. Okay, so it booted up. I push a button. I push the next button, and I can make the LEDs turn on. Okay, not exactly the most impressive thing we've ever done on a robot, but the key to making these things work is to move a little bit at a time. And the next thing that we're going to move on to is making our motors spin. And we're actually going to use something really similar to what we've done right here. Let's take a look at how we're going to make the motors spin. OK, now we've talked about H bridges in the past. And on this chip right in here, we have an H bridge chip right in here. OK, now the H bridge chip uh, has, as you remember from when we soldered it, a lot of ground pins so that our electricity can get back to ground. But more importantly, so that some of the heat that the chip generates when it's controlling your uh, motors because uh, the L293D is not all that efficient a chip that burns off some of your valuable battery power as heat when it's making the motors run. That heat can, as well as the electricity going to ground, can come out through these pins and it goes into the ground plane of our circuit board uh, very easily. Now, what do I mean by a ground plane on the circuit board? Well, uh, you'll notice, like I said, I was doing copper fills when I designed the printed circuit board. Let's take a look at some of the layers. This is a two-layer board. I'm going to turn the top copper layer off. And this is the bottom of the board. And I am going to turn the GND layer on. Where is our GND net? And everything that you see white on that board, OK? So this is the underside of our board, looking at it right in here, is one big sheet of copper. And this is called a ground plane, and it's fairly common on, uh, on designs. And what's really nice about that is that our L293D is sitting right over here. We've got vias, the little holes that run through the board. You'll remember seeing four of the vias underneath your printed uh, underneath your surface mount chip when you were soldering it. They're right in the middle of the board, right by where the motors hook up. And the electricity comes down through there. And now when they try to get back to ground on the battery, they've got this whole path. Anywhere there's white, the electricity can go. So there's a much bigger path and a much lower resistance for that electricity to return to ground. Uh, the other thing that happens is that if you've got high frequency signals, and nothing that we're doing on here really consists of a high power or high frequency signal, but in certainly in more advanced electronics design, the ground plane can help you uh, reduce uh, electro a magnetic radiation. Um, in other words, electrical noise that could jam other wire, uh, wireless communication systems. So having a ground plane on the bottom of your board is pretty common. We don't do it in a lot of the boards that we manufacture in class because we use a toner transfer technique that doesn't do a good job of filling in solid areas. But when you get a commercially made board done, um, yeah, uh, learn a little bit more about copper pores. And uh, here you go. Uh, you can uh, yeah, have lots of, lots of copper on the bottom to transfer things around. Now, one thing 
that this also does, because remember, if something's electrically conductive, there's a good chance it's also thermally conductive, and we know copper is both electrically and thermally conductive, is that if you have to desolder a pin right here, and this has a really good solid connection to this big ground plane, okay, you have to put more heat into that to get the solder to melt. Okay, uh, it's one of the things about working with uh, big ground planes and through hole plated um, um, boards is that the solder gets right inside all the way through and you've got to heat up the copper on both sides of the board, including the copper right around the big ground plane right here. And it can make it challenging sometimes to try and uh, use the solder sucker to pop things out from your board. Anyway, so that's our big ground plane and uh, we're just taking a look at that because we were right over here and we were taking a look at these ground pins that go right down there to take the power back. Okay, um, now we've got enable pins on your board as well and the enable pins are on there to control each side and sometimes people use the enable pins for uh, pulse width modulation or speed control. In fact on my previous version of the board that was how we controlled the speed. We just turn one side of the board on or off using the enable pins. I don't have enough pins to do that on this design, enough Arduino pins, so I've hooked that up uh, to our 5 volt supply and it comes down through a 10k resistor and these are permanently turned on. So really on this circuit, you don't have to worry about the enable pins. If you're hooking up uh, your own L293D in a different circuit and it's not working, do check to make sure that enable one and enable two are both at five volts if you want that side of the board to activate. Now controlling this side of the board, because this side of the board has two outputs and they come down here to this header that your motor is plugged into. So if you look at the headers that your motor are plugged into right here, yep, motor one and motor two, uh, they're plugged in right here. And that comes out on this side right here, right next to your L293D, right tucked in behind the LEDs there. And those are your outputs from the L293 and they will get your full um, bat a motor battery voltage minus a, um, a volt or two that gets lost inside the chip right here uh, whenever you turn things on. Now, uh, to turn them on, we have Arduino pins right here. We have pin five that comes out right along here and connects to input one. So input one controls output one. If I set pin five high, this sets this entire wire high and it comes out here and it tells input one to come in here and connect output one to our uh, motor power supply right here, VS. That goes out and it runs the motor and the electricity flows through the motor in this direction and comes back in here, assuming that input two is set low, which will set our output to and connect it directly to ground. So to make your motor turn in one direction, on this side of the board, or on this side of the robot, you set uh, this pin high, that's pin five, and you set pin four low. Now, the other thing that we'll do is you'll notice that we've got a couple LEDs on the front of the board, and you can actually monitor the state of your inputs right here, because if I've set this one high, then the electricity will come through and flow through this LED. But if I want the motor to spin in the other direction, and I set this side high, on this side low, the electricity is going to come back, flow up through here, and turn on the other LED. So in order to make our motor run, we've got pin 4 and pin 5 that we're going to hook up to, and pin 4 and pin 5 are hooked up to the right-hand motor, assuming you've plugged your motors in on the uh, same sides I have. If you haven't, eh, you can change the pin numbers, or you can just go back and plug your motors into the opposite sides. It's a nice thing about having pins. So let's come in here and uh, add a couple more terms. Oh, that was. Uh, no, okay, that's where we were before. That is the code that I want. All right, so we're in here. Let's add a couple more codes in here. And so we need a couple more names. And we're going to say const int motor. Uh, left. I'm going to call one motor left PWM, okay? And I'm going to say that is pin 6. 
motor left and direction. I'll talk a little bit more about why I've chosen those terms in just a minute. Okay. Motor right PWM is going to be equal to five. Direction is equal to four. Okay, so PWM, as you'll recall, is pulse width modulation. And pulse width modulation is what we use to lighten and dim LEDs. And it lets us turn the pin on for a fraction of a duty cycle. So instead of it being on 100% of the time, we can use our pulse width modulated pins to be on 50% of the time or 25% of the time. And what that means is that our motor can be on 50 or 25% of the time. And they'll do it so fast that it'll look like the motor's running continuously, just like the LEDs look like they're on continuously, but really it'll just be running at half speed. It's a way of very efficiently controlling the voltage going to the motor the average voltage, because if you're on half the time and off half the time, your average voltage is half of your motor uh, battery voltage. So we're going to set that right in there. We've got these names right in here. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make those pins into output. So in setup right in here, give yourself um, some space, pin mode. got into a big argument back when I was in grade 10. My mother insisted that I take typing instead, <clears throat> instead of metalwork. I really, I'd done metalwork nine. I really wanted to do metalwork 10. Mom's a business ed teacher, dad's a shop teacher. And dad's a smart man. He's not gonna argue with mom. And uh, I was learning to be a smart man and not argue with people who have my best interests at heart because it came in really handy knowing how to type. Uh, so anyway, uh, that will also explain why my typing is better than my welding. So uh, let's come down here. We've got these uh, setups in here, pin mode. Uh, we've set them to outputs. So let's come in and let's make a motor turn. Okay, so if I push this button, I'm gonna have uh, LED left turn on. So I'm going to digital right. I'm gonna make the left-hand motor turn on too. Motor left PWM comma high. Motor left, dir, comma, low. Okay. And if I want to turn the motors off, I'm going to set both of them low. Okay. Because remember, you can tell a motor to turn on, but if you don't tell it to turn off, it won't turn off. And just this one, it was set low to begin with, but this is going to be a bit of redundancy. Okay, and uh, let's just test one motor at a time, make sure that nothing too bad is gonna happen. And let's go ahead and upload that. Saw some flashing right there. My boot up sequence, nothing's happening. I turn this on, aha. Now you'll notice I've got no motor spinning, but now when I push the button down, this LED turns on and this LED turns on right here. And when I let go of the button, they turn off. The reason I've got no motor spinning is because my motor power is still turned off. If I turn on my motor power, this uh, LED, it's blue on mine, might be a different color on yours, right at the back turns on, indicating that motor power is on. And when I push the button, 
Now, watching that, I think, yeah, I think the camera is grabbing that enough to see that that is spinning backwards. Let me just make that a little bit bigger. I'm not using a lot of this screen for other things. There we go. So that's turning backwards when I push right on there. If I wanted to turn that in the forwards direction, because this is an H bridge, uh, okay, I'm going to change that to low and this one to high. And there we go. We've uploaded some new code, the boot up sequence, and motor's running there. Now, I don't know if you can hear. Let me just hold this in close to the microphone. I hear a little bit of rattling when that's going around, and I suspect I may need just to increase my clearance a little bit between um, the optical encoder right here and this pin right down here, because if I turn that on right now, I don't hear that, okay? We don't want the encoder bumping in to the uh, encoder ring. We just want to be able to read the encoder ring. So I may need to add a little spacer right in here, or I may need to increase the height of these little spacers um, right in here at the back. Mine are pretty low, yours might be a bit higher. So you can play around with that. And yeah, don't spend too much time beating that in uh, encoder into your encoder ring. Something's going to give if you keep doing that. Let's test our other motor and see if we can get that working. So basically the same uh, commands right in here. We're just going to copy these. Make sure I copy them, not cut them this time. And pop them in here where I turn the LED on. And then I'm going to copy these. in here where I turn the LED off and again to keep it nice and tidy I'll go auto format and so right now we're just testing things when it comes to driving the robot we'll uh, uh, we'll actually throw a lot of this out but we want to test things one at a time on here to make sure that they're coming together and that they're all working and that we understand our system okay so Oh, I suppose I do need to come in here and tell it that it's the right motor that's going to turn. This is what I miss about not doing this live in class is that somebody would be sitting there saying, uh, Jason, shouldn't that be right? There we go. Let's tell the correct motor to come on right here. and the correct motor to turn off. Uploads, boot up sequence, ready to go. That side still works. This one's running backwards. You hear no click, click, click when that one's running. So if that one's running backwards, we just come in here and change this into high and into low. Now, depending on the way you wired your motors right down here, and whether you soldered you know, this side of the connection up to the top of your motor or, or to the bottom of your motor, okay, so depending on how you wired that up, your motor might spin in the opposite direction of mine. That's perfectly fine. We can fix that in software, okay? So make sure you know how to get your motors spinning forwards and then make them stop okay so we're almost at the point where uh, we can do interesting things with our robot we can make our motors go forward and backwards we've got two leds we can turn them on and turn them off we'd really like to be able to get some speed control in here on our motors so um want to take just a quick moment to look at a diagram of, of how that speed control is going to be working. Okay, 
So we've got um, uh, we've got two pins, okay. And let's just uh, take a look. How am I going to draw this? We've got two pins in right here, and if we've got a chart that looks something like this. Okay, and this is five volts, and this is zero volts. Okay, and we come in here, and to make our motor spin forward, let's take a look at the uh, left motor. So I'll do the PWM pin in blue right here. And to make that motor go forward, I leave the PWM pin down low. And then to make uh, it turn on, I set the dur pin high. And this makes uh, for our left motor Okay, now to turn it off, I keep the PWM pin low for a while and turn the DIR pin down low right here. And when they're both low, okay, they both should be right at zero, but I draw them right next to each other so you can see that. And this one is the motor is off. Okay, and then if I take the DIR pin and leave that low, but I turn the PWM pin high like that, this is our left motor goes backwards. Okay, so that should be fairly straightforward. That's what, uh, well, we didn't intentionally spin them backwards. We did spin them backwards and to change the direction, we just changed which one was at five volts and which one was at zero volts. When they're both at zero volts, they're both off. Technically, if they're both at five volts, they're also both off because it's an H bridge and you need to have a voltage drop across your H bridge to make it go. Okay, now the interesting thing with this is that the reason we call this one the PWM pin is this is the only one that can do PWM. Okay, we just didn't have enough PWM pins available on the board for me to do analog right. Now, if I set my PWM, okay, to, uh, to, to 128, halfway in there, okay, it's going to come down here and it's going to go low and then high really 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 fast and we won't notice it doing that okay but because i set it to an analog right of 128 on the pwm pin 128 is halfway to 255, which means it's on half the time. So this is a 50% duty cycle. Okay, so <clears throat> so that's good. I leave um, I leave my direction pin low. Okay, and this should be going backwards at 50% of the speed because the direction pin is low. So the direction pin controls the direction, PWM pin controls the speed. Let's see what that looks like for us when we run it. So what I'm going to do is right in here, we're working on the left motor. Instead of a digital write command, I am going to do an analog write command. Oh, not to the direction, only to the only works on the PWM pin. That's why we called it that. So come in here and change this. Okay, so analog rate with a factor of 128 gives us a 50% duty cycle. So it should be turned on 50% of the time and uh, should be, uh, what did we say that was gonna, 
run backwards, I think. Yes, because if we set DIR high, it goes forward. There we go. Our little boot up sequence happens in right there. And oh, it's moving forwards, but it's moving forwards slower. than it did before. So why is it moving uh, forward? Probably because I was looking at the wrong pins when I said what was forwards and backwards on there. OK, so now let's try setting this DIR pin to high while well, we've got our PWM pin set to that 50% duty cycle. And now what we'll see is that 50% of the time, uh, okay, right in here, uh, it's going to be on, but because this one's high, it's going to be on during these periods where this one's high and this one's low, okay? In here, it was on where the PWM pin was high. In here, it's gonna be off when the PWM pin is high because both of them are high and there'll be nowhere for the electricity to go. So uh, let's change that uh, direction pin right in here. And now we're moving backwards at half speed. Okay, so we've taken a look. We can make our motors go forwards and backwards, and we can make our motors go forwards and backwards at half speed. There is a challenge that I am going to leave you to think about, okay? And that is, what happens if I want to go at quarter speed? So. I'm going to set this down uh, to about yeah, 50. This may not be enough power to make it spin, but we're just going to take a look at it and give it a try right here. Oh, you can hear a faint whine. And that faint whine says, I'm giving it some juice but not quite enough to make it spin. It's the same sound that you hear when you take a cordless drill and just squeeze the trigger a little bit. Uh, we need to bring this up to, let's see, 70. You need to just give it enough juice to overcome the internal friction of the motor and the gearbox and get it running. So, oh, I, the whine is a little louder. 70 is not quite enough to make it go. Here's the boot up sequence. Oh, there we go. It's barely turning and it stalls out really easily. In fact, at the other stages, if you'd give it a little kick to get it going, that overcomes the static friction. And once it gets going, its internal resistance is a little bit less. Now it's moving backwards at a fraction of the speed. And here's the conundrum I want you to think about. I'm going to switch this to high. And now, no humming or anything, it's getting quite a bit of force. It's almost running at full power. It's not at full power, but it's almost running at full power. Why does it behave differently when we put it in reverse at a fraction of the speed versus when we want it to spin forward? The answer can be ascertained by looking at what analog right does and what the direction pin does, 
And if you understand that, then you should be able to make, figure out a way to make your motor go forward at three quarter speed, go forward at half speed, forward at one quarter speed, and backwards at quarter speed, half speed, and three quarter speed. Okay, and that will be useful and important to understand when it comes time to make your robot work. Alrighty, um, that's probably enough for, uh, for today's uh, lesson. We've gone through and we've tested many of the critical components and you may be having a problem with some of your critical uh, components that you need to fix up next time you're in the shop or have access to a soldering iron. Hopefully everything's working really nicely for you. If it is, that's great. And take that away and ponder what's going on and how do I proportionally control the speed of my motors both forwards and in reverse. If you can figure that out, then that's probably a pretty good sign that you're understanding how we're turning it on and off. Remember, there's nothing tricky here. This is just like your tethered mini sumo robot. If you turn the H-bridge on and put high voltage here and low voltage there, the motor spins in one direction. If you put high voltage here and low voltage there, the motor spins in the other direction. You reverse the direction of flow through the motor, you reverse the direction that the motor flows at. On our mini sumos, you did it by pushing switches. On here, you do it by pushing digital switches and controlling a chip. It's the very same thing. But these ones we can press really, really fast and we get this neat little pattern in here and I'll let you ponder what's going on there and figure that out. Um, this should enable you to put your robot down on the ground and flip the top back down in here and button it all up and come up with a drive sequence where you can go forward one foot, turn right, forward one foot, turn right and come back and pretty much end up where you started. Okay, so I'm in order to move on to the next level of your tethered mini, sorry, of your boom bot, what you're going to need to be able to demonstrate is that you can make it drive forward, that you can make it turn, and that you can control your speed at fractions of a speed, both forwards and backwards. Next video, I'll talk a little bit about how I did it, but you've got a week to think about that. Uh, let's see, code right in here. Um, these definitions right here, you probably want to make sure that you save because we are going to keep building on them and using those terms in future uh, bits of software. And certainly our setup routine, we're going to save that. We're going to use it in future versions of the software. The loop routine, give it a file name as a test code or something like that. Save it to your computer so that if something stops working, you can come back here and <coughs> redo some of your preliminary tests. Remember, when you're trying to troubleshoot, go back to basics and find the simplest thing that you possibly can that might be wrong. Okay, folks, have a good time, and you now know what you need to do uh, to get your robot to drive forward. Just remember to tell it to stop every now and then.